a rainy day today, um, although we need the rain, so uh, happy to have it here. Um, we're excited to have the town hall with you all today to talk about uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we'll, we'll just discover an, uh, a lot of new information here. Um, we're being joined by uh, none other than uh, our very own uh, Dr. Zvelli, uh, who is the chief medical officer for the county. And of course, uh, the beloved John Joya will be joining us as well um, to have the conversation. Um, so in terms of the sort of flow of the conversation and uh, how to ask questions. Um, John will kick it off here in a second. Then we'll turn it over to D Dr. Svelli to talk through some of the main sort of top lines in terms of what's happening with vaccine distribution in Contra Costa County. Uh, we'll then engage in a conversation um, where we'll ask some more questions and then you all will be able to um, ask questions yourself of the good doctor. Um, and hopefully we'll provide a really informative hour for you here uh, to learn all about uh, what's happening with vaccine distribution. We also have Spanish interpretation available today via Zoom. So if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube or YouTube or YouTube and would prefer to listen in Spanish, please head over to the Zoom link. My staff will drop that into the comments section now. So again, uh, go to the comment section um, to uh, get uh, um, Spanish interpretation. Now I would love to introduce uh, the one and only uh, County Supervisor John Joya. Thanks, Buffy. And, and on behalf of really all of Contra Costa, thank you for being our voice in Sacramento and your leadership and really advocating uh, for the types of resources um, that we've needed here in Contra Costa. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, these are challenging times, um, but we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and uh, We'll talk today about the vaccine rollout. And I want to first start by saying the single most important thing um, we are committed to in Contra Costa County is getting vaccines into your arms as soon as possible. And uh, we have worked hard to develop the infrastructure to do that. And we are working with our healthcare partners uh, who will also be part of this important effort. Um, the community clinics, Kaiser, John Muir, Sutter. This is the largest um, public health effort in our county or in our state's history, um, the largest mass vaccination effort. And um, we are committed to making it successful, meaning getting vaccine out as soon as possible. In fact, this morning, um, our health officer, uh, announced that we are committed to getting 1 million doses into people's arms by July 4th, um, following up on our president's commitment to get 100 million doses out in the next 100 days. Our ability to get those doses into your arms depends on getting the vaccine. Um, that is this complicated process of the vaccine coming out from the federal to the state and then from state to counties. Um, but we are all working hard, and I know Assemblymember Wicks is doing her work at the state level to ensure that we're getting vaccines uh, that we need on a predictable, regular basis. That is key. Um, that means we are committed to getting um, up to 9,000 vaccinations per day. We went uh, in the first month uh, of the rollout from zero to nearly 6,000 vaccinations a day. So we have a little ways to go to get up to 9,000. Um, and we are seeing a lot of demand both on the county's website, the online system and phone calls. And we'll talk more about that. There is now a phone call system as well as uh, online. So we look forward to uh, hearing your questions, answering them. And this is really just the first of, uh, of, of several ways that we want to get information out. And thanks, Assemblymember Wicks, for really helping put this together. Thanks, John. I appreciate you being here and all your leadership in the county on this and many other issues that uh, we get to work on. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce to you Dr. Svelli, who's the one who really has all the answers here for us. No, no pressure there, Dr. Svelli. <laughs> um, but he's the one who's going to provide an overview of uh, current state of play of COVID-19 vaccine um, distribution um, as it pertains to uh, both sort of the medical questions around it, as well as the logistics um, challenges that we are confronting in terms of making sure we're getting those shots in your arms 
um, as John just said. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to him uh, to give us a brief overview. Sure, and just before I get into the vaccine, I'll just um, just go over the state of COVID in general, because it's, it's actually been about almost exactly a year since uh, first case of COVID in the U.S. came in February of last year. We had the first uh, people coming off the Diamond Princess cruise ship in the, and the first case of community transmission in the Bay Area. So um, right now we're sort of near a peak, uh, as is most of California and uh, much of the country. Um, we Our hospitals are still full. We have 2.9% of our ICU beds are open. So that's the lowest it's been for a while, uh, 288 people in uh, county hospitals with COVID-19 right now. So just a reminder, it's fantastic that we have the vaccine and it's safe and effective and it, it is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a remarkable achievement, but just a, a reminder that we still need to do what we uh, need to do as far as staying safe, wearing a mask, uh, not gathering with others outside our pod, and if we, and especially not gather, not gathering indoors, and also keeping our safe uh, physical distance. Um, that so that said, uh, with vaccine, um, the county has really operationalized uh, a large vaccine delivery infrastructure in a very short amount of time. To give you a sense, it took us about um, five months to be able to. Uh, test 5,000 people a day for uh, COVID. It took us one month to set up the vaccination infrastructure for 5,000 doses a day. Um, we have multiple vaccination sites. There's, I'll go sort of through the basic framework of what they are. Um, first of all, there's our multi-county entity partners. So there's uh, Kaiser and Sutter and they have their own infrastructure set up and they're right now vaccinating people over 75. Uh, within the county, uh, we have several county sponsored sites. Uh, some are associated with CCRMC, so West County Health Center in San Pablo, the Martinez Health Center and Pittsburgh Health Center. And then some are associated with the county public health system. So we have um, a site at Contra Costas College in San Pablo, uh, we have another site opening, opening in the Richmond Auditorium next week. Um, we have one at DVC, Diablo Valley College, and one at the Nick Rodriguez Community Center in Antioch. Um, so those are all county sites. And then the county is also partnered with a bunch of uh, Safeway pharmacies and Rite Aid pharmacies where we supply them with vaccine and tell them who to um, who to give appointments to, and they're vaccinating in their stores as well. We're also working with our fire partners to uh, add some sites throughout the county. I think there will be a West County site as part of that, and uh, we're we're getting close to being able to to uh, identify the site and uh, announce it publicly. Hopefully, um, that will go live in about a week and a half or so. Um, and we're also working with other partners. Uh, John Muir will start vaccinating next week and that's using county allocated vaccine as well. Um, the state allocates uh, to us about 12,000 first doses per week right now and then the sec they also give us second doses to match the number of second the number of first doses that they gave us three or four weeks ago. So um, all in all we are able to start vaccinating about 12,000 new people per week with the county supply. And then in addition to that, there's what the state allocates to Kaiser and Sutter directly. So about 65,000 doses have been given uh, to over 52,000 uh, unique people in the county. So that's over five, like almost 6% of the eligible population. And right now we, um, we did finish with phase 1A, which was mostly healthcare workers and people who live in congregate facilities and nursing homes. And now we are at the beginning of uh, finishing up phase 1A and then beginning of phase 1B, which is uh, the elders older than 65, but really focusing on those who are older than 75. We're prioritizing them first. And um, the state has laid out this tier structure, but they are talking about potentially changing that um, to be more strictly age-based. And um, they're, they're uh, 
we're waiting for a formal announcement on that. So we're still seeing uh, what's going to happen with the essential sectors. Uh, but for now, we are focusing on those over 65, and there's plenty of those to be vaccinated. Uh, there's almost 200,000 people over the age of 65 in Contra Costa County. So as you can see, with 12,000 doses a week, it's going to take us a couple of months just to get through that population alone. We're hoping the allocations from the state increase. Um, and they are hoping that they will get more from the federal government to be able to pass more on to the local uh, county health departments as well. Um, and uh, we have a, a equitable and ethical allocations committee that is looking at the state recommendations for who to vaccinate and tailoring our local recommendations to match. Um, so I think I'll stop there and just the rest I'll take with questions. So I think one question that uh, comes into my office a lot is, I want to get a vaccine. How do I sign up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if you're over the age of 65, um, there's a couple of options. If you have Kaiser or Sutter, you can contact them. They're both focusing on, on the population over 75, and they both have uh, vaccines to allocate. They're short on appointments as well. So it may take a couple of weeks, but generally they can give you an appointment. You can also reach the count, uh, get vaccinated through one of the county sites that I mentioned before by going to uh, coronavirus.cchealth.org. And over there, you'll see the vaccine page and you can click on that. And if you're over the age of 65, you can submit an interest form. Uh, when we get your interest form, then we will send you a ticket to schedule a vaccination appointment as your turn comes up. Um, so right now, people who are over 75, when they submit their interest form, they will get their ticket usually within a couple of days. Um, people who are between 65 and 75, uh, we send those tickets as openings become available. We expect there'll be a lot more of those in a couple of weeks. Right now, you mostly have to be patient. Um, but there will be more appointments coming available soon. Fact, the I other see. option uh, I'll, I'll mention, sorry, if you are not, not someone who is good with the computer or you are helping someone who's not, who doesn't navigate computers easily and the website isn't uh, an option for you, you can call our 800 number, which is 1-833-VAX-COCO, V-A-X-C-O-C-O. And um, arrange for an appointment that way. I see we're already getting uh, Buffy. We're already getting uh, some good questions in, and uh, including some of the common questions we get into our office. Um, so we often hear that people want to first go to their uh, to their provider, like Kaiser. Then they hear they should go to the county. Um, uh, Dr. Savelli, tell us uh, what people should do in that regard, because we're, we're, we are vaccinating a lot of uh, Kaiser patients as well, but what should people do? Should they go to their provider first? That's a great question, um, and, and this might change over time. I, I, I can tell you that we at the county really have a no wrong door approach to this. We will vaccinate everyone regardless of their insurance, even if they don't have any insurance. We do ask for some insurance identifiers um, in order to be able to build the insurance on the back end, the administration fee, but if someone has no insurance, that's fine. We will vaccinate them even without that. Um, and should they go to their provider first? Um, I would try them first. Uh, I think it's hard to know who at any one time will have more appointments in their area. And um, part of it is also has to do with transportation. I know, for example, that Kaiser has been offering appointments to people who live in our county to go up to Vacaville because their Contra Costa appointments may be booked, for example, but if someone's willing to travel, uh, they're offering them appointments up there. So that may be sooner than something you can get at the county. In general, our county appointments are about two weeks in the future. Right now is what I can tell you uh, for people um, that for people who are receiving tickets today. Um, so um, I think Kaiser is about the same. 
Uh, I've heard that Sutter is about the same for both of those. I think if you're willing to travel to far reaches of the state, you can probably get something sooner. Yeah. Well, one of the other yeah. questions that's come up a little bit is, you know, we've seen studies coming out of, I think, the UK around looking at the efficacy of just one shot versus getting two. Um, have you seen anything, at least in terms of either at the CDC level or at the, you know, public health level here around considering going down to one shot to get more shots in arms? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the UK decided... Um, not to go to one shot, but rather to delay the second shot from the normal three or four weeks to a three month interval. And the goal was exactly as you said, assembly member, it's to get more people their first shot because we, we do think from the data that m most of the effect of the vaccine you get after that first vaccine, the second one acts as more of a booster. However, the studies that were done on the vaccine and in this country were uh, really large and they really looked at a, a large group that got both shots. So there's much more limited data on people who got one shot. The little bit of data is encouraging, but it wasn't enough for our CDC and uh, even our state, I know our state did look at this, to recommend delaying the second dose. So for now we are sticking mm -hmm. with that, with the original dosing schedule, which for Pfizer is three weeks apart, for Moderna it's four weeks apart. But I will emphasize, if your second dose is late, it's okay. It's still considered a valid dose. It will still give your immune system that boosting effect. Um, so I, if you're not getting your dose on exactly that day 21 or day 28, don't worry too much about it. You've got probably gotten most of your protection from the first dose and that second dose will give you a booster, even if it's late, it's considered a valid dose. We hear a lot, uh, Dr. Sviele, about um, folks being concerned about uh, side effects. Can you address that issue and assure individuals that this is a safe vaccine and, and what side effects they, they can expect? Yeah, so I just um, I just got my vaccine. I had a sore arm for a couple of days and that's a really common side effect. Another um, common side effect after the second dose is to feel a little sick for a couple of days. Like you might feel like you have a little bit of a flu. Some people even get like a low grade fever or muscle aches or joint pains. And that's not unusual, particularly with the second dose. Um, that said, that's, that, that's a good thing. It means your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do. It's making those antibodies and giving you that protection. So it's not exactly a side effect, but it's a, it, it's something that's to be expected. Mm -hmm. um, there are some allergic reactions, but they're quite rare. Um, we're seeing about one in a hundred thousand people with the vaccine will have an allergic reaction. Um, and uh, we, we are set up to observe people after the vaccine for 15 minutes, if you're someone without a history of severe allergic reactions, if you're someone with a history of severe allergy or anaphylaxis, we watch you for 30 minutes. We have the EpiPens and all the medications needed to deal with that if that should happen. And uh, we haven't seen people dying from this vaccine. There've been millions of doses administered now. Nobody's dying. So I really feel like this is a safe vaccine and an effective vaccine. So, um, so all the health officers I know have have, uh, have gotten it when their turn came up, and uh, and all the the doctors and, and nurses, medical professionals that are looking at the data. I think we had like uh, over eighty five percent acceptance rate um, for people getting the vaccine when they had the opportunity to do so. What, in fact, on that, there's been a few questions about whether individuals who have specific allergies. Um, um, and a perfect example is my daughter has a, a nut allergy. Um, and people with those types of allergies, can they take this vaccine? They can, they can. Now, a lot of people have allergies. Um, the most common ones are like seasonal pollen allergies. Um, but even someone who has a nut allergy, we, the, the ingredients in this vaccine uh, don't generally come from foods. And so food allergies are not going to be cross-reactive. 
Um, if you're allergic to one of the ingredients in the vaccine and, and the list is, is given to you at the time you go get it, and, and you can also look it up on the, on the FDA websites for both the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, if you're, which it's very rare that someone is allergic to one of those specific ingredients, almost unheard of. But if you are, then um, you may wait for one of the other vaccines to come out. But that's, that's like I said, it's so rare. I have not heard of a single case. So uh, yeah, if you're someone with seasonal allergies, food allergies, it's just fine to get this vaccine. Well, one other question that uh, has come up in my office quite a bit is um, once folks are vaccinated, how should their behavior change or not change? Uh, in terms of social distancing and masks and things of that nature. And sort of when is the sort of timeline of when we think we can get back to, you know, some social behaviors the way we used to. Um, and then I think kind of with that question also is once you're vaccinated, can you still transmit the virus or not? Or do we not know? So that so a couple of the questions there for you. Yeah. And the, those are related to each other. So I'll start with the second one first, that we don't know the answer to that. We don't know, we know the vaccine protects you from getting sick. And even if you do get sick, a small number of people will still get COVID, but they'll get a milder case of COVID. So much less likely to need to be hospitalized. Um, it stands to reason that it also at least reduces your transmission, right? Because if you're less sick, if you're not sneezing and coughing as much, you're not gonna, you're not gonna transmit it as much, but we don't have data to prove that yet. So we know it prevents disease. We don't know that it prevents transmission. Those studies are being done. So now going back to the first part of your question, can you take your mask off? Can you start hugging people? Um, not really, not really. You still have to follow those precautions uh, because we don't know if you can transmit it to them. And we know a lot of the transmission is asymptomatic. So you still should mask, you still should avoid indoor gathering. Um, one way somebody said it, which I really liked is we, we're we all, even those of us who've been vaccinated, we're all gonna be doing all those things until we're all not, you know? So I think we, we just have to do the responsible thing. We don't know that we can stop transmitting. Um, so, so yeah, keep masking, keep distancing, keep washing your hands keep avoiding indoor gatherings for the time being. Uh, and remember, it's gonna take us a while to vaccinate the whole population. So when will life go back to more of a normal? My best guess is sometime towards the end of the summer um, when we've gotten something like 80% of our population immunized and achieve more of a herd immunity, so. Great, and a lot of folks are asking, can you repeat the phone number that you had said? And we'll make sure we, we put it in various comments of wherever people are watching. Oh, sure, it's 1-833-VAX-COCO, V-A-X-C-O-C-O, -C -O, which I wish I had brought it with me. It's like 829, <laughs> hold on, let me, yeah, it's 1-833-829-2626. So just remember yeah. Vax, V-A-X, Coco, C-O-C-O, -C -O, and then figure out the, le the numbers. But yeah. it's, it's not 1-800, it's 1-833, right? Yeah, that's right. 833-VAX-COCO. Yeah. We, do, we do recommend that if you are someone who can handle computers, that you do it through the computer. The whole time on that line can be long. And if uh, everyone tries to do the phone, then it gets even longer. So the, it, it doesn't give you any advantage over doing the online interest form. And again, right now we're only taking um, people over 65 on both the phone and the online. Got it. Um, it you, you mentioned with our goal of getting up to 9,000 vaccinations a day, and we're only getting about an average of 12,000 doses a week. What is it gonna take uh, uh, to get to that point? Uh, when do you see us actually getting uh, that larger supply and what is it gonna take? I know, aside from uh, Buffy's continual advocacy and in, in, in fighting for more, but uh, what, what will it take? Um, yeah, we, we did ask the state for a, a bunch more doses because we, we were hoping to do some mass, mass vaccination sites. What will it take? I mean, I think um, President Biden uh, did um, activate the War Powers Act to try to increase production. 
And I think that that's a really important step because that means that the companies that manufacture the vaccine will be able to get their raw materials sooner. Um, but I think it will, even though that, that just got triggered, right? So it's gonna take a little while to get the whole supply chain moving faster. From everything I've been reading, uh, it will probably not be until um, late March, beginning of April, that we'll start to see a significant number of more, more doses. We might see a little bit more in February, maybe a 10% increase, but, but I expect that to really hit our targets of, of eight, 9,000 a day, we, we're not gonna be able to do that until later in the spring. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, let's, um, let's switch gears here to some of the questions that we, yeah. we were receiving on Facebook and YouTube. And if folks We've have We've got questions, lots of them. So they're great questions. I know. We, great we've questions. got a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Nicole Duart asks on Facebook, and I, maybe I didn't pronounce your last name correctly there. Sorry, Nicole. When will we, or will we be able to choose which vaccine we want? Generally, no. Um, the county doesn't, uh, we don't get to choose which vaccine we get. We get uh, allocated either Pfizer or Moderna or some of both. And because of storage requirements and temperature requirements, not every site has both vaccines. Um, the good news is they're both pretty much equally effective and safe. Um, so in general, I would say take the one that you can get <laughs> at whatever site you're going to. Um, we, we do, uh, as more and more second doses come around, we do have people who maybe got their first dose at a different site come back to your site. So we will probably try to keep as many of the sites stocked with both kinds as we can logistically uh, accomplish. But uh, I think they will probably most likely have like 95% of one kind and just save a few of second doses of the other kind. So uh, whatever you're offered is what I would accept. Right, because you can't mix and match, correct? You can't do Pfizer and then do Moderna later. Yeah, you're, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to get the same. The second dose should be the first as the first dose. The, the CDC actually says that in desperate situations, like if you really can't get the same one, um, then you should, it's okay to do it. But I, I really, what I would recommend is uh, just wait a little longer. It, it, it seems like the immunity uh, lasts quite a while. And I think even if that, that, that second booster dose is a little later, I think that's fine. Great. Uh, let's see, we have um, M Barkin on YouTube asks, what advice and help can be given to someone who has an anaphylactic events, uh, who's had one um, and wants the backup, who's sort of, sort of predisposed potentially to have an adverse reaction. Is there the possibility of um, vaccination centers with extra medical backup? Um, yeah, we, we uh, for a while, um, had something like that going. Uh, we were finding that there was very little need for it, that all of the vaccination centers that, they have Benadryl on hand, they have EpiPens on hand. Um, so they're able to um, accomplish the observation period. If someone looks like they're, they need a little longer, you can stay longer than the 15 or 30 minutes uh, and they'll watch you for longer. So they're not gonna kick you out if there's any, anything sort of questionable. And they all have really good access to emergency transport resources. So. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, we've given many, many doses in the state and the allergy thing is not turning out to be a big issue. Uh, the, the sites are able to handle it. And I assume, well, I don't want to assume, would it be better to get a vaccine than within your provider at say a Kaiser or a Sutter medical facility, if you do have that concern versus, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, that's a good question. Yeah, they're, they're mostly associated with hospitals. And, and you know, so the, if you needed to be transported to a hospital, I guess that, that would be a little shorter of a ride. But the, the ambulances are all well set up for that. So that's not, I don't think it's necessarily a guarantee. So um, yeah, but if you're really worried, I think that's one thing you can consider is, is going to 
your medical provider, your medical insurer. Uh, Dr. S Dr. Sfielli, um, I was at the West Contra Costa School Board meeting uh, this week and, and Dr. Farnatano gave a presentation about, um, about COVID in schools. And there's a number of questions here about what are the what is the priority for teachers and school staff with regard to receiving the vaccine? How will that change potentially if if the state changes uh, to an age based system? And just generally, how does the vaccine rollout uh, interrelate with school reopenings? Um, we've heard demand you know concerns by school districts to get school staff vaccinated um, before uh, they reopen. And just can you add to that also early childhood care as well, in yes. addition to K yes. through 12? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, educators are a really high priority. As, as the a dad of two teenage girls, <laughs> I, I really see, and, and I've also heard, you know, just how, how homeschool is not the same as school. So opening school, um, in-person school is a really important priority for us in the county and also for the state, I know. Um, if the state changes to an, so, so under the, um, the old tier system, um, educators, I think were part of phase 1B. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would have been sort of coming up next after the 65 year olds and older, or even between, uh, you know, 75 and 65. Um, if, if the state changes to a strict age-based criteria, would they have uh, telegraphed is that if you're a teacher who falls within the age base, you would get your vaccine, but otherwise you would have to wait until your age range comes along. So, you know, if, the, if we're doing 60 to 65 and you're a teacher who's 61, you would get your vaccine then, but if you're younger, you would have to wait until the state comes down um, to the next age group. Uh, we have not seen the formal guidance on that in writing from the state. So I think they're still considering all of those things. There's a lot of competing interests that, and, and, and considerations that we do know that vaccinating older people prevents more deaths because it's, it's the older people who get worse COVID and are more likely to die. We also know that it's important to open the schools and to get our educators and early childhood workers all vaccinated. So, um, so I think the state is really taking a close look at that. Um, it's a really, really difficult decision, which is why I think they're taking their time. Um, but I'm really hopeful that sometime before the next school year, we can get all of those groups vaccinated regardless. Great. Uh, Lisa Johnson on Facebook asks, will you be mandating that all healthcare workers and other workers in long-term care facilities be vaccinated? A long-term care facility in Wisconsin has implemented this, which is consistent with the federal government's communication indicating that employers can legally mandate employees be vaccinated. Yes, that's a good question. Um, employers can mandate that everyone be vaccinated. The county... Um, as a public health entity is not prepared to mandate vaccination right now. And I, I think that's universal across the whole state. I don't know a single county that is mandating vaccination. Um, and that part of that is because the vaccine is still under an emergency use author, authorization from the FDA. I think if the vaccine um, gets the more rigorous regular authorization where they look at more data, more long-term side effects, um, and, and really, um, if that step is arrived at, if that stage is arrived at, I think people will be more open to mandates. But at this point, we are strongly and highly encouraging it, uh, both for your own, uh, your own health and as well as protecting the community, but we are not mandating. And are you just on that note, you know, we've read some articles that some healthcare workers are not received, they don't want to get the vaccine, some frontline, you know, first responders are potentially down in LA where, you know, they were trying to, I think, like bribe firefighters to get it or something, uh, which, in my opinion, I'm like, give, I do anything for the vaccine. But, you know, uh, is how widespread do you think that is of, of like healthcare workers and frontline workers not wanting to get it? You know, um, 
We, I think with the first go around when, when we were first offering it, I think we got about 75, 80% of people accepted it. And then by the time we came around for the second dose for healthcare workers, a lot of those people who declined the first time were more will, were, were like, actually, I'll take it. You know, they, they're seeing that their colleagues are doing fine and uh, nobody's growing a tail or any horns and, and that it's safe and effective. And so I do think, uh, so I think our uptake was quite good. I think over, like we got close to 90%. Uh, I think some other groups may be more hesitant. And I think as more time passes and people see that it's safe and effective and we have more data, um, then people, I think, will be more inclined to agree. But yeah, our experience so far is exactly as you were saying. Uh, we have people knocking out, down our doors and we don't have enough appointments. So I think there will be a time when uh, we as a public health department will need to focus our messaging more on what's called vaccine hesitancy, you know, people who are worried for this reason or that. And, and I understand those worries. I'm by, by my nature, I'm not an early adopter. I like to see something out there and proven. So I really um, empathize with people who are a little more cautious. Uh, but, but I do, so far, everything I've seen is very encouraging on the safety here. Doctor, we get a number of questions about whether we're gonna implement a notification system. San Francisco has set one up. The state is looking at expanding uh, its system. Um, it seems that that would be a really uh, good way to notify uh, people when they're in the queue. Um, can you talk about yeah. that? Oh yeah, so if you go on our county website and, um, and fill out the interest form, or even if you do that through the uh, call center, then we will notify you. We're sending emails out every two to three days, basically saying, hey, we still got you, don't worry. It's just your turn hasn't come up yet. And then when your turn does come up, that's when we send you the ticket. So, um, yeah, we we do believe that um, when if you're over 65 and you want to fill out an interest form, go for it. You know, um, and I know that uh, Kaiser Sutter they are actively outreaching to their members who are in the right age groups to get them in. So, yeah, I I know uh, just to. Add on to that, Erica Good on on Facebook said, "I'm over 65 and signed up at the Contra Costa website days ago, but I've heard nothing, not even an acknowledgement that I registered. What's the protocol for responding to registrations? Should I register again? Uh, I think, yeah, she's just curious if she'll get a notification that she registered. Um, I Sh should she? Have? I yeah, I wonder if something fell through there. I think the emails is telling people, hey, we still got you." I, um, Worship. Yeah, I think they went out a couple of days ago for the first time. So if you didn't get anything uh, in the last couple of days, I do think it's okay to register again. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this question I've seen a lot now, um, Cass uh, Dugan asks on YouTube, does the vaccine cover all the new worst mutations of COVID? Oh, what a great question. Um, we don't know the answer to that. So everyone or many people have probably heard about the UK variant that was first described in England and South Africa. Um, Pfizer did study and said that they think their vaccine does cover that. Um, we haven't heard about Moderna. We have heard since about several other mutations, including some locally in, in California and then the United States. And uh, we don't know how well the vaccine covers those. There's good reason to be optimistic. I, I will say that we haven't seen evidence that the vaccine doesn't cover uh, any of these mutations, but uh, all those studies are being done. It's a little bit of a, a race against the mutations, right? Like the, the virus uh, mutates at a certain rate and the more infections there are, the more opportunity it has to mutate. So we're really trying to knock it down with really good social distancing, uh, really good staying at home and not gathering and really good vaccination. And if we can knock it down, then the mutation rate will really slow way down. Um, I'm really hopeful that the vaccine continues to cover, but we don't have that data to, to say that definitively yet. Great. Um, one, a couple of questions have come up around um, 
someone's a primary caregiver for someone who's older, they're younger, they're, you know, they're either caregiving for an elder parent who lives in their house or an elder spouse. So they don't hit the threshold to get it now. Is there a way they can get moved into a higher priority? Um, yes, I think uh, if you're a caregiver for someone, uh, I wish I had this in front of me. I know if you're a caregiver for someone who is, uh, severely disabled, then you yeah. do qualify. Uh, yes, the there was actually a letter. letter the, yeah. yeah, there was a letter from the State Developmental Disabilities Council yeah. on yeah. that to clarify that, that we just saw so that, and I know in the county, you would check the box under home health worker is the box, yeah. not exactly. IHSS, although you're eligible if you're an IHSS worker, but even if you're not, um, that, and you're caring for someone who's developmentally disabled, yes, you can, um, you're eligible in this first category, correct? It's the, it's the healthcare worker category. Yeah, in the, it's in the phase 1A, that's right. And the state, uh, last night, we had a call late into the evening and they did say that they're planning to issue further clarifications on that topic in the coming days. So and so e even if we, even if the state moves us to an age-based system, we will still have the the top two tiers that we're already working on, which is healthcare workers and uh, residents of congregate care facilities. Correct? Those will correct. stay top priorities. Correct. Correct. And 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 uh, there's a federal partnership with CVS and Walgreens that has gone to many of those uh, skilled nursing facilities and congregate um, assisted living facilities. And the county also is sending out mobile teams and. We're also sending out teams to uh, low-income housing and other senior housing, uh, low-income senior housing and other, other senior housing complexes to try to get more people vaccinated there as well. Yeah, thanks. Great, uh, Jamie uh, Perez on YouTube asks, are you considering having a wait list for the times that people with vaccine appointments cancel at the last minute or don't show up? Um, we have a way to fill in last minute cancellations and we um, have we overbook so we have we have really good data on what percentage of people don't show up every day and we're already overbooking our schedule by a certain percentage to accomplish that so um, it's not going to be a, like a last minute call a bunch of people uh, to try to drive over real quick. We're adjusting for that automatically. You're like the airlines. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, Doctor, and yes, exactly. Yeah. Dr. Lita Scout has a question, which really uh, we've heard a lot of similar questions as young cancer patients have the same mortality rate as those over 80 and uh, so should they have a, a higher priority? So we've gotten this question consistently, people who are medically vulnerable and at risk who are not 65, um, what, what it, where do they stand in all of this? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And we've gotten a, the same question many times as well. Um, at the moment, the state has um, indicated that people with high-risk conditions within an age group can be prioritized. So within the 65 and higher, you can prioritize people with uh, high-risk conditions, but you cannot prioritize them if they fall outside of the designated age group. Um, and I know that's a really, really, really tough call. I think each each uh, diagnosis has slightly different data. We don't know how many people, like what the risk is for this diagnosis or that. So I think that it's very tough to issue intelligent guidelines. And also the, um, at the county, our goal is to really get through as much vaccination as possible. We don't wanna spend a lot of time getting documentation from people and saying, so I think that the, the state, um, and the county for that reason of simplicity of just getting doses out. Don't spend your time checking, just spend your time vaccinating. It's really focusing on trying to make the criteria as simple as possible. In my understanding, is, is that the reason really that the, the state is considering moving to this age-based system is to make this process go faster as opposed to sort out all the different priorities and, and, and confirming that people actually fall into those particular tiers or are eligible for those tiers? 
Yeah, I would say that's one of the key reasons. Yeah, the simplicity, um, the simple messaging. There's also the, the mortality benefit in general, you know, there's always exceptions, but in general is higher the older you go, which is why there's, they're moving down in age. And um, yeah, so I would say those are the main two things. I mean, the third thing is that right now we have, have a hospital surge, you know, and if you look at who's in the hospitals, who's filling up all the ICUs, it's generally older folks. So if we can get that group protected, I think we'll be able to decompress the hospitals and get over this surge much sooner. And then everyone can sort of have an exhale, a moment to exhale, you know, so. It, you know, there's uh, Jennifer Huber asks, uh, this just came up about equity issues, which is similar to the question that Kamar Paul Dhaliwal from the Rice Center asked on Facebook is really, um, uh, how, how, how are we going to address, we've talked about uh, focusing on equity. Um, so why don't you talk through how, how those issues will get addressed as we uh, roll out the vaccine in terms of availability, access, uh, and, and equity. Sure, yeah. So yeah, we have sort of twin, twin priorities. We want to we want to vaccinate volume at scale, and we want to keep things equitable. Um, we are looking at equity um, at the county through something called the uh, HPI Healthy Places Index, where they look at each census tract uh, and, and um, all sorts of equity issues are folded into that index from access to transportation, to education, to health outcomes, um, access to fresh food, et cetera. So we are trying to make sure that we are um, setting up vaccination sites in places that uh, are in the lowest HPI quartile, that we are getting those patients in to vaccinate if they're in the right tier. Um, and it's, it's really important to us that the vaccine not just go to people with access and privilege, but it really go to the whole community and uh, particularly communities that have been disproportionately affected. So um, we're working hard on equity issues. Um, and at the same time, just try and get as much vaccine out there as possible. I, I know Buffy and I are going to continue to advocate that there are um, sufficient and accessible vaccination sites in West County, some of, because there are communities here in West County that are some of the hardest hit uh, in terms of case rate uh, from in the county as a whole. And um, so why don't, why don't you mention the, the current sites that have been identified in West County? I know there've been some sites identified, some high volume sites, some are up and running, some will soon open. Um, so why don't we talk about just where those are right now? Yeah, the, the, three, um, the three big sites, high volume sites in West County are uh, Contra Costa College, the West County Health Center, and starting, I think next, it's either Monday or Tuesday will be the Richmond Auditorium. And um, those are all uh, high volume sites. I think we're, we're working with the fire departments to open another site up in the Pinol area because sort of the, the Northern part of West County is uh, where we see a gap right now. Um, also eventually we think all of the health centers will be vaccinating. So at some point, uh, we think the North Richmond Health Center will also be vaccinating. And um, there are some pharmacies. I think there's a couple of pharmacies in West County. That yeah, there's are a pharmacy in El Cerrito. I don't know. I don't have the list of which one that, that, is, that is vaccinating. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And, I think and we are working with our community partners like Lifelong Medical, for example. They have several sites, uh, downtown Richmond, as well as San Pablo. So, yeah, but both of those we're, we're allocating vaccine to, um, and they're doing active outreach to, to their elders as well who are in tier right now to bring them in to vaccinate. Right. And these, um, our we, sites are in addition to the, also the, the, the Kaiser sites. So Kaiser, correct. if you're a Kaiser patient, those um, Kaiser, there's Kaiser Richmond and then Kaiser, Kaiser Richmond is a high home. volume site. Yeah. Right. Okay, and, gonna... and my goal is to have every pharmacy vaccinating when there's enough vaccine for it. So we're, we're trying to get more, more of them signed up. 
So we're going to do some rapid fire because we've got about five to seven minutes left. So okay. um, we're going to time you on this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, kids, our kids, uh, we, th we know that they're sort of vectors, if you will. Uh, do we anticipate them getting vaccinated anytime soon? Not soon. The vaccine right now is uh, Moderna is only for over 18 and Pfizer's for over 16. So those older teens can get the Pfizer vaccine. The younger kids, we're waiting for studies uh, to come out. My best guess is late 2021, early 2022, there'll be a vaccine for them. Okay. Can we go to another county or, or does the county only vaccinate its own residents? We vaccinate people who live or work in Contra Costa County. Got it. And is that similar to other counties, you think, the, the work part of it? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, how long does it take the vaccine to protect an individual? Um, about 14 days um, after the second dose, you can think of yourself as fully immunized. About 14 days after your first dose, you probably have a good level of immunity, though not as much as you will have after the second dose. Okay. Is insurance required? No. No. Okay. Um, if you've had COVID-19, do you need to wait 90 days before taking a vaccine? And if so, why? You don't have to. You're allowed to get it if you want it as uh, early as uh, 14 days after your positive test. The um, but I wouldn't rush. I think the immunity that you've gotten through natural infection is probably close to similar to the immunity you, you're going to get to from the vaccine. So um, if it was me, I would probably hold off and let someone else receive that dose who's not had COVID-19. But if you really want to, you can, you can do it as soon as 14 days. Okay. Uh, will these vaccines be needed to be taken annually or just these couple of doses that we're doing now? Don't know how long immunity will last. We'll get more data on that as time goes. Uh, some scientific reason to think that it will not need to be an annual thing, maybe something like five to seven years, but not annual. Even with the new mutations or we don't know yet? Even, even with the new mutations. Yeah, it, it, flu is an annual vaccine. The flu virus mutates much, much more rapidly than the coronavirus virus. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there specific uh, allergies that can trigger a bad reaction? Um, I, only allergies to the ingredients in the vaccine itself are, are known to, to be um, triggers. Um, so yeah, I would I would look it up if you're concerned. Yeah, I would look up on the FDA emergency use authorization the ingredients in each vaccine, and and but but they're they're not common. Uh, ingredients that people are allergic to. Uh, okay, and John, you can jump in here and do rapid Yeah, I, I wanna ask, cause I just got an email uh, that responds to some of the questions uh, that we've gotten. There's a number of people that have signed up on the website and say they haven't heard anything yet. And Erica Jensen, uh, just you know, from our County Health Department in response to this just said that now everyone who's registered uh, should will be getting an email message telling them that we received their registration. <laughs> So if people have registered and have not received a, a response that they've registered, they should re-register on the site is what she's saying. It could be that something got typed in incorrectly. So the county is now sending a confirmation out when people do register so people will know that their registration went through. So that's a new piece of advice I, I wanted to offer. Great. Um, and by the way, it does, uh, sounds like Sally on Facebook said just now while on this Zoom, I got my, we haven't forgot about you email <laughs> while oh, we've been talking. So some of those That's went great. out. Um, let's see. Uh, someone asked, I haven't seen my adult son in almost a year after my husband and I, and eventually my son get vaccinated. Can we let him come home for a little while, give him a hug, eat meals with him? Um, well, you could, although it's not without risk, right? Like you, you're probably going to be more likely safe, but not perfectly safe because the vaccine is 95% effective, not 100%. But also there's a chance that you could have been exposed, have an asymptomatic infection and transmit it to your adult son. So you have to think about him as well. So um, 
So I would I would say it's it's always a calculation. We all make those calculations every day during COVID, and um, I would say you could consider it, but it's not a hundred percent. Okay. Um... Cheryl Webster, I've heard from medical staff that there are less reactions to Pfizer than Moderna. Is that true? Um, not that I know of. And on that note, uh, what's the deal with AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson? Are they going to get approval soon, do we think? And how will that up the supply? Um, any vaccine that gets authorization will add to the supply. Um, Johnson & Johnson is an interesting prospect because they're a one-dose vaccine and um, and can be stored in the fridge, doesn't need the deep freeze. So that would be significant addition. Um, so hoping, hoping that that comes through. But from what I've read, there won't be significant supply of that until something like uh, April or May. Um, AstraZeneca may get approved uh, sooner, but I think the data, the trial data on that was a little bit, um, uh, was a, they're, they're waiting for more data. The okay. FDA is waiting for more data. Uh, let's see here. How can community organizations like the Panola Rotary Club help in efforts to organize vaccine implementation? Um, that's a great question. I'll have to get back to you. We, we definitely can use volunteers and you can um, contact the county and sign up as a volunteer. There may be point where, you know, we may need to people directing traffic at vaccination sites, especially when we get to mass vaccination sites. And in a couple of months when there's enough supply, we, we will probably need more help. Um, also giving people uh, rides uh, to vaccine sites who are, you know, at home. That's another possibility if you've been vaccinated yourself. So, um, so stay tuned. Uh, let's see. Um, Charlene Harris asks, how many black people were part of the clinical trials? And can we expand that to um, uh, Latinos, others, communities of color, generally speaking? How diverse were the trials? Um, yeah, I don't have that data right but I know Pfizer and Moderna, um, um, I remember reading the Pfizer data and that they made an active effort to enroll uh, community people from communities of color in their trials. So I remember thinking it was pretty good on Pfizer. I don't have the Moderna data in front of me. Um, so, uh, but you, that is all publicly available uh, data that you can access on the FDA site, FDA authorization site for both of those vaccines. Okay. And then just um, lastly here, um, and I think you've answered this, but I, but a lot of people have asked it, so I just want to make sure we're clear. Folks that have specific providers, Kaiser, Sutter, et cetera, should they go there first or should they go to the county first or both? I, I would try their own provider first. And if not, go to the county. We're happy to have you. Um, I would just ask that if you sign up at both and you get an appointment, that you cancel the other one so that we're not uh, holding a spot unnecessarily. Great. Well, um, John, did you have any last follow-up questions here? Well, other than um, we need to do this again. I mean, obviously there's so many questions and there's, uh, there's so, so much new information coming out. And especially if the state makes a, a new announcement with regard to you know, possibly scrapping the tier system. So we will look to plan uh, more um, information sessions like this, especially as, as the vaccination centers open. There's many good questions. And right now the, their, um, the county's COVID hotline is still a number you can call for questions as well. But let me put out the number for the appointments again, the one eight three three. Vax, V-A-X, COCO, C-O-C-O -O, uh, is the number to call for appointments. And again, we're, we're committed to getting these vaccines out as quickly as possible. And we need uh, continual advocacy at the federal level. And our, I know our state is doing that. Buffy, anything um, you see that the public can do to help in that effort? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I've 
I read the press like you guys do. I hear from my constituents who are very eager to get shots in arms here. Um, I am pushing uh, the governor's office and others. You know, there were a bunch of us that did a sign on letter to the governor last week asking for more transparency for the counties and expediting this. As you may have seen uh, yesterday, the president did sign the uh, War Powers Act, which will increase production hopefully very quickly. Um, so I, I think you know, letting your voices be heard to people like me on that are important, to your state senators, to your congressional leaders, to your US senators, um, all of that is important. Um, but I, I feel your urgency, your, your, your fierce urgency of now. Um, I'm eager to get vaccinated myself. Um, as, as we all are. So um, yeah. just want to appreciate um, John for putting this together with me. Dr. S um, Z Zvelli, <laughs> sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Appreciate you being on lots of questions. We will do this again. Um, and if, especially if there's a big announcement by the state on changing the priorities, we'll definitely be back in touch. But don't hesitate to reach out to my office or John's office. Um, we can answer more questions for you. So thanks everyone for getting on. Uh, appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you.